Hello, this is Dr. Saldivar. Today we'll be looking at chapter two in the Feldman text, Essentials of Understanding Psychology. Uh, this chapter focuses on how the mind, the brain, the nervous system work together as the foundation of human behavior. The basic element of the nervous system is the neuron. Uh, a neuron is just another term for a nerve cell. Some neurons will be located in the brain, Others will be located in the spinal column, spinal cord. Uh, others can be found in other parts of our body. We have nerve cells all over our, our bodies as humans. But in general, they're going to have a very similar structure. We'll look at the structure and function of this example neuron. You'll see on the left-hand side of the image uh, is the cell body. This is the, the fatter or wider part of the neuron. That's where most of its mass is located. The nucleus of the, of the neuron is located here in the cell body. And then both at the edges of the cell body and then the opposite end of the cell, you have these uh, finger-like or tentacle-like structures called dendrites. It's dendrites that uh, allow for connection and communication from one neuron, one nerve cell to another. More on that in a moment. Um, this long uh, segment that uh, connects the cell body to the dendrites on the other side is called axon. So the axon is that whole uh, column. This is where information in the form of electrical impulses and chemical signals travel. And each axon is covered by uh, a fatty layer called a myelin sheath. Um, so this is the basic general anatomy of a neuron. There are more details, but for our level of, of course, uh, of the course, I'm content to leave it at, at this stage. Now, I mentioned earlier about neurons communicating with one another. So here you see uh, two neurons. One is uh, labeled here the sending neuron towards the top left of the screen, and then the receiving neuron. If we highlight this section here, where uh, you have two dendrites that are uh, closest to one another, and then that, so that's the point where communication would take place between the neurons, and we uh, zoom in there, you'll see that the sending neuron has a number of neurotransmitters that it is shooting over the gap from its side over to the receiving neuron. And then the receiving neuron has uh, certain uh, appendages, certain areas of its dendrites, that receive or capture those neurotransmitters. Uh, the neurotransmitters just refer to molecules, uh, to atomic structures of different chemicals that are involved in facilitating the communication from one neuron to another. I don't want to go into a lot of detail in this discussion. Again, that's a more advanced topic. What you need to know is just that neurons talk to one another, communicate with one another, send messages or signals through the whole of the nervous system by lining up their dendrites and then having these neurotransmitters, these little molecules of different kinds of chemicals, shoot from one to the other. Uh, we're dwelling on this uh, because this is an area, this is a, a literal area, the, the specific area in, in, uh, in the nervous system, in a, in a human body, where things can go wrong. If there's an issue with the neurons being able to produce or distribute these neurotransmitters, if the body is malnourished or the body uh, doesn't have the proper level of different nutrients to be able to produce neurotransmitters uh, correctly or, or in, the, in the correct proportions, then this is where a lot of what we would call um, cognitive mental behavioral problems tend to start. So this may seem, and, and I guess it is, you know, a very technical kind of anatomy physiology issue, but it's also the place where literally a lot of our problems that we may think of as mental problems, mental health issues, behavioral issues, begin in this in this modest uh, location, this modest process of one neuron communicating with another. This is why we're discussing this again, because neurons are the fundamental building block of human behavior. They have three roles that they play. They receive information. They pick up information from the world around us via our senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, uh, in uh, the next chapter, chapter three of Feldman, we'll look in more detail at this particular process of receiving information from the world around us. 
But once information has come in, once we've seen something, tasted something, felt something, heard something, then our, our brains go through an information processing uh, routine in order to determine where and how that information that's being taken in by our senses needs to be distributed among our nervous system. So for example, if I see something that represents danger, eventually, and of course this process is happening in, in, in thousands of a second usually, but eventually if I see something that's a danger, my brain will go through a, a, a process where it takes information and determines what's going on. Oh, there's danger ahead of us. We're out walking and we see a stray dog that looks like it's pretty mean and it may, it may present a danger. So I should back up and try and get out of the area. That uh, process is the end result, uh, albeit uh, it's a very quick process, but it is a very complicated process where we've taken information, we've received information, and we've gone through an information process um, protocol that our brains have laid out. And that information, the conclusion being, okay, there's a stray dog in front of us, it looks like it's mean, could be a danger, we've got to get out of here. That information is transmitted via other neurons to the appropriate part of our body, uh, our legs, our torso, for example, and so we can walk or run away. Um, in the same way that other stuff we see in the world around us may uh, call for us or require us to take some action, uh, whether that's uh, walking away, running away, climbing up something, stepping into something, sitting down, picking something up, all those kinds of actions are gonna be the result of this basic process of receiving, processing, and transmitting information within the nervous system. Communications between the billions of neurons that all of us have in our bodies are at the base of everything we do. That's the big takeaway from this whole chapter. No matter how complicated a particular behavior might be, learning a new language, um, performing in a complex uh, athletic uh, competition, uh, playing a piece of music on an instrument, communicating with other people in a foreign language, no matter how complex our behavior, it all is rooted in the actions, the activities of the neurons in our nervous system. We can divide the nervous system into different areas. I'm not going to dwell on these too much in this discussion because they are explained in the chapter. Um, but the first division of the nervous system is the peripheral nervous system. This is basically all the nerve cells outside of the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, so our arms, legs, fingers, toes. Um, our torso, our, our, our uh, thorax and abdomen. The uh, peripheral nervous system, we can divide further into the somatic or voluntary nervous system and the autonomic, not automatic, but autonomic nervous system. So the somatic or voluntary system is where the stuff that we want to do, that we our, our brain tells uh, our hands, uh, fingers, toes, feet, whatever to do, that's where that is taking place, voluntary nervous system. The autonomic or involuntary nervous system is where a lot of the stuff that's vital for us to do as humans just to survive is taking place. None of us, hopefully, are sitting here having to think to make our hearts beat or make our lungs respirate. We breathe and our, our hearts beat um, without our conscious control so that we can get about doing other, <laughs> other things, just living our lives. Um, so a lot of the stuff that our body does is uh, autonomic or involuntary. Uh, we can further divide this autonomic or involuntary nervous system into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. The definitions are there on the, on the screen as well as the chapter. I don't want to get deeper into it for this discussion. The other major division of the nervous system is the central nervous system, and this is going to be the brain and the spinal cord. Um, the brain and spinal cord are really core to a lot of the stuff we do in terms of behavior, that is what we tend to think of as behavior, you know, things in our conscious control, the things we want to do. Um, but of course, the peripheral nervous system has a major role to play too in keeping us alive and helping us just function in the world. Different brain regions specialize in performing different functions. So different areas of your brain are not interchangeable in the sense that there's certain stuff, as you can see from the, from the graphic, the front part of our brain uh, is, for example, in charge of motor functions, of... of uh, movement, standing up, sitting down, writing with a pencil, typing on a, on a keyboard, playing an instrument. 
that particular kind of uh, behavior of of activity is governed by the front of our brain, right above our our uh, eyeballs, the prefrontal cortex. Vision, as another example, uh, is governed by the uh, part of the brain that's right uh, in the back of our head. So here, uh, the takeaway is uh, just remember that there are different areas of the nervous system, excuse me, different areas of the brain that specialize in different functions. They're not interchangeable. Along with the nervous system, the endocrine system, which is a system of uh, hormone-producing glands through our, our body, like the pancreas, uh, adrenal gland, thyroid gland, um, also plays an important role. Uh, it's a different role from the nervous system, but there is a tight connection, uh, a tight dependence between these glands, the endocrine system, and the nervous system. Again, this gets into much more advanced topics in anatomy physiology that I, w I don't want to dig into here, uh, but as the chapter does, I want to highlight that there is uh, other stuff, <laughs> other parts of our body besides the nervous system that are actually involved in thinking and cognition. Final idea that the chapter introduces is this idea of neuroplasticity, sometimes called brain plasticity. This is something that seems to be fairly unique, not 100% unique, but, but not common in other living creatures besides humans. So <clears throat> neuroplasticity refers to the ability of human brains to adapt and change over time depending on stuff that happens to us. That may seem fairly straightforward or not, not particularly well. You know, I mean, that's, uh, you may ask reasonably how how interesting or, you know, what's a big deal, but uh, it is a big deal. Again, not every living creature is able to do this, and humans can do it to a degree um, that suggests that it may be quite key to our ability to function as humans. Now, there's structural plasticity, which is uh, fairly common among living creatures, so this goes beyond humans, and this is where the process by which experiences uh, that we've had, uh, whether they're recent or, or past experiences that, that form memories can change a brain's physical structure. Um, the way that we react when we see an old friend or a, or a beloved family member. The way that we uh, react when we see uh, a toy that we, uh, we love to play with when we were children. Um, coming across a story or a song or a book or whatever that we were fond of when we were younger. Um, so taking something from our past and seeing it again, and it elicits some kind of, of reaction from us. Um, this can uh, come from the way that our brains have been shaped by those prior experiences. This is fairly common. We know that a lot of living creatures uh, have memories and kind of act on them, both in positive and negative ways. I gave some positive examples. Negative examples would include, for example, um, if uh, someone had a negative experience of some kind, and they had some trauma because of that negative experience. Uh, they may see a person who reminds them of, of the trauma they felt, the abuses that they uh, experienced, and that makes them uh, not feel good. Um, that's an example of uh, a negative uh, outcome or negative reaction to structural plasticity. But there's also functional plasticity. And this is um, much more complex and still something we're learning about and, and trying to understand really well as psychologists. Functional plasticity is when a brain function actually moves from one area of the brain to another. For a long time, this was thought to be kind of a myth or a legend. It wasn't thought to be possible. In uh, recent years, the last 20, 25 years, because of advances in technology that lets us see how the brain works in real time, including CAT scans, MRI, um, other kinds of brain imaging techniques, we are able to see that it is possible to have to see brains change their physical structures in ways that a lot of people, for example, who have lost parts of their brain because of injury or illness, uh, and then initially they may lose, for example, a part of their brain that's involved in speech uh, because of a stroke or because of a car accident. You lose the part of your brain that's involved in speech, and logically enough, you have trouble speaking, uh, or maybe you can't speak at all. And yet over time, it will happen sometimes, not every time, but it will happen that those brains will not just heal themselves in the sense of the wound, the, the damage is repaired, and so a person doesn't need to have uh, a bandage on or, or take medication because of infection or whatnot. But the ability to speak, even though that part of the brain is damaged or even missing, the ability to speak may redevelop, not in every case, but in many cases. 
because the brain is able to take advantage of this functional plasticity in order to rewire itself to help someone rediscover or redevelop an ability that was lost because of brain damage. Again, this is an exciting area of research, one that psychologists are just starting to, to dig into. Uh, hopefully in your lifetime as students, you'll be able to take advantage um, in terms of medical treatments for yourself, for loved ones. Um, there'll be medical treatments and other kinds of, of applications to research in this area that'll be very beneficial for people. All right, let's review major ideas from this chapter. Neurons are the basic element of the nervous system. Neuronal connections based on are based on uh, a complex uh, system process of chemical and electrical signals. We talked about neurotransmitters as one example. Uh, the brain, the nervous system, and the endocrine system all work together. Uh, they specialize for different functions, but all of them uh, play an important part in, in working with one another in order to help us think and behave, and they are the foundation then of human behavior. Finally, we talked about how the brain is plastic enough to accommodate uh, cognitive changes over time within limits, uh, but it is possible for the brain to, to physically change in response to experiences, including even traumatic experiences, uh, disease or uh, physical injury. And so it's possible, not for sure, because sadly it doesn't happen 100% of the time, but it is possible in many cases for someone, for example, who has been injured or been uh, had some kind of illness uh, and lost the ability to speak, to with effort, with time, with physical therapy, with uh, the intervention of, of physicians and others, um, it is possible to learn how to speak again or to walk again uh, or uh, other kinds of functions. And these are all due to this concept of neural plasticity. That concludes this presentation. I hope you found uh, this overview of these ideas from Chapter 2 in the Thelma text to be helpful as you go in to do the reading. Good luck.